Okay, our tradition has been to have a PGP key signing in September. And I've been doing a cryptology news and history review as the entertainment before the key signing. We're obviously not key signing during pure virtual meetings in pandemic. And I'm not convinced we'll go back to doing it in the future. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Um, but in the meantime, the I enjoy doing the history review, both recent and ancient. And so we continue to do so. Um, I'm using a different technology for slides this year. This is Slidey, one of several uh, JavaScript libraries that lets you have slides uh, in a single HTML file for the whole presentation uh, generated with Pandoc from Markdown. So I can have both a long document of notes and, uh, and the slides. So that's what I'm doing. Interesting topics of cryptographic security, not general security from the last year. Uh, there was a problem nearly a year ago with some stale um, old certificate authority root certs uh, that were problematic. Hopefully that's been fixed by now. Got to keep an eye on those uh, those root certificates. The <clears throat> we all remember, I hope, ROT13. Well, the Unicode equivalent of ROT13 is ROT8000. That's a hex number, um, and that's uh, steganographic as well as encrypting. Uh, however, it, you, you got to do it carefully so that it's it you can't just do it with a tr command at the command line oh well yet another example of why pgp isn't fit for purpose the german ministry of information security sent one of its private keys when somebody asked can you send me your public key so that i can decrypt your message if even they mess up Maybe it's a solution in search of a problem. The news feature for this year, what is this quantum cryptography that the government is, and all of the WAGs are talking about? Well, it's cryptography that allows for quantum computing. What's quantum computing? Well, that's when you have bits that can be in a superposition state. Uh, Schrodinger's cat may be alive and there or not there. The, uh, there, there is quantum hardware available for purchase today. And you can hear some amazing statistics for the number of quantum bits available uh, from the manufacturers of the quantum annealing hardware, which is um, great for traveling salesman problem. Uh, we can solve those using non-determinism in short time. But the quantum circuits or quantum logic that's required for algorithms that are relevant to cryptology uh, are shipping in much smaller numbers of qubits still. Uh, these would theoretically allow for non-deterministic parallelism to evade the classical performance limits, particularly on factoring large numbers, uh, but also uh, the, the other key public key sorts of algorithms, pardon the pun. Yes, we're discussing post-quantum cryptography before we discuss quantum cryptography. Quantum cryptography mostly doesn't exist yet and would be using the quantum logic or quantum 
uh, hardware to do the cryptography. The Chinese Space Agency claims they've entangled bits between their space station and the ground uh, station, so they claim to have done one bit worth of quantum cryptography. Uh, okay, maybe. For quantum cryptanalysis, that's when you're using quantum hardware to do fast factoring of the RSA primes or whatever to crack a classical encryption, uh, usually being the public key infrastructure key exchange, because quantum doesn't help you much with cracking a uh, like AES um, or D uh, old DES symmetric encryption. So when we say post-quantum cryptography, the parentheses go around post-quantum. Uh, we're looking at cryptography that can survive uh, your opponent having a big quantum computer. We're talking about survivability, not needing quantum hardware to do your encryption because you don't want to pay for that. Although Google and Microsoft both have uh, quantum hardware available in their cloud for rent. Um, but, you know, renting a slice of a very expensive machine to factor the number 15 doesn't seem like a good purchase to me. Now, the, the problem is there are several algorithms that theoretically could be used to do discrete log or break elliptic curves, which is basically a discrete log problem, uh, or prime factoring. Uh, prime factoring and discrete log are sort of interchangeable algorithmically. Um, pretty much every unbreakable cipher um, actually, at least partially all unbreakable ciphers uh, have been broken. Uh, previous years, I've discussed um, how the NSA uh, broke Russian and German use of the perfect unbreakable cipher because they did it badly. Uh, if you perfectly unbreakable ciphers are only perfectly unbreakable if the humans using them are perfect. And as we demonstrated with PGP a couple slides back, um, users aren't perfect. Similar to Emily's laptop problem. So the 20th century RSA and other public key infrastructure algorithms are just not guaranteed against a major breakthrough in number theory uh, or quantum hardware that provides a uh, technological shortcut uh, to doing the number theoretic problems like factoring and discrete log. And Shor's algorithm is the classic um, algorithm for that's hypothesized as being used for this on the quantum hardware, but uh, Grover's and variational quantum factoring VQF uh, seem to work seem to be more practical uh, in baby trials. So that may be where the real future is, but Shores has been, has been the stocking horse for ages. So is this a problem for us today when the hardware is just being able to factor 15 or 200 and 40 something um well yes uh, we discuss forward secrecy as old messages not being broken if you lose the host key later uh, because uh, there's enough randomness added in the key exchange that recording the key exchange um, doesn't let you uh, figure out what the key was uh, just by getting one of the two host keys. Well, a generalization of forward secrecy would be old messages uh, can't be broken by other kinds of breakthroughs 
like quantum actually becoming workable in, say, the year 2030. Uh, NSA did this to the Russians, as I mentioned. Their perfect cipher was broken when NSA collected enough messages that they could tell when don't ever reuse these keys one-time pad messages the pads were actually reused they compared lots and lots of data uh, and with computers and found well ibm card accounting machines uh, and found the duplicates and broke the unbreakable code by data hoarding well, instead of listening on the radio for Morse code messages to write down and keep forever, now they're listening on the Internet and recording encrypted messages in their Utah data farm uh, and saving it forever. Uh, once they get a big enough quantum computer, they're probably going to put it next to this Utah data farm. So if you have something you want to hide from the NSA 10 years from now when somebody whose politics you've been mouthing off about today uh, is in power, um, yeah, maybe you do want it to not be breakable in 2030. Um, no matter who you think the fascists are, uh, if the fascists get control of the horde of old messages and quantum computing, things we said bad about them today will be, while encrypted, will be readable in 2030. Um, and some of us, you know, expect to be alive then. So, yes, um, the, there, there is a desire to have a uh, system that will work in the future even when quantum is realistic, if it ever, I mean, it, it's not guaranteed this is going to work. That's right. Do you want to say something, Ben? Your mic's on. Yeah. Um, I was just, are you saying that the uh, current um, fear, uh, practices on perfect forward secrecy are expected to be vulnerable to quantum security or that yes. or, okay yes. well that's current, current forward secrecy pro protects you in case your personal keying material is later disclosed um so that like that german min ministries key was exposed their old messages if they were using perfect forward secrecy versions of PGP, their old messages may not be broken, um, but their signature can now be forged. Um, and so they're going to have to discard the key, and their signature is no longer validatable on their old messages, but their old messages aren't disclosed because the key wasn't actually used uh, to encrypt the message. It was used to negotiate the symmetric key that the message was uh, encrypting. But their signatures are broken. Um, and <clears throat> the, uh, the, the current forward secrecy methods may be adequate in the sense that um, the RSA and the like are being used to negotiate the session key, same as in current forward secrecy. But the our signing ability, our verification ability, um, and spoof ability, you know, it, it, it all falls apart if it becomes trivial uh, to break an RSA key. So... Uh, even if forward secrecy technically still works, uh, it, 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 it all falls down. So uh, ma making factoring RSA um, certificates uh, cheap where, you know, this hardware ain't cheap, but it's what 
if it works, it's going to be well within NSA's budget and any Fortune 500's budget. And I'm not willing to bet that the NSA, the FSGB, uh, the, the People's Republic, um, and those dodgy guys in Korea, and all the Fortune 500s all have my best interests at heart. Uh, at least one of those 505 organizations that can afford this sort of data center um, aren't going to be hostile to my interests, even if they don't know I exist. Uh, they're all they're all data mining us all already. So it's um, this may not be in your threat model, but in dystopian plausible futures, uh, it ought to be. So the National Bureau of Standards, or rather NIST, the artist formerly known as National Bureau of Standards, uh, has been doing competitions for new standards, which is a good thing because they got caught uh, cooperating a little too much with the NSA and not enough with academia previously. So openness and transparency is good. Uh, this is, I think, the third round of the, the third standard done under open academic competition, uh, AES and SHA-3 being the previous. And its work seems to have worked fairly well. The... Uh, when you get the online version, you'll be able to um, see the National Institute announcement and Q&A and commentary from Bruce Schneier, my uh, favorite commentator on these sorts of matters. Oh, I'll make my window just a little bigger for you. There we go. Come on. Fit my screen, damn it. There we go. Um, so they're into the fourth round. They have uh, nominated several winners that can move forward toward draft standards already. Um, there's one suite that covers both. The, oh, darn it. Thank you. I have to keep moving if I want to select something. Um, the crystal suite covers both the PKI key exchange mechanism and signature, which like like RSA, you can use RSA for both key exchange and signing. Um, and the dilithium portion of crystals, dilithium crystals, get it, uh, uses the previous competition SHA-3 algorithm uh, for its signatures. Um, and then two other variants uh, for signature or moving towards standardization. And then several more uh, key exchange uh, algorithms have been moved to round four for uh, further competition and research. Uh, MacAleese is actually a very old, well, old, comparatively speaking, uh, classical encryption algorithm that appears to be uh, post-quantum sound despite not being designed for that criteria. Mere weeks into round four, this summer, uh, candidate psych was broken. How badly was it broken? One x86-64 core hour to break. That's like trivial effort to break. That that is terrible. It is out of the competition. Um, but that this is why pitting the best uh, open source community cryptographers against each other. Um, each of the propo sixty nine proposers, uh, which are teams, groups, collaborations. Uh, they act as the peer reviewers for all the others and apply their cryptanalytic skills, their devious hacker minds, 
uh, to trying to break all of the competitors as well as trying to break their own for, you know, honesty. And yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's a thing. It, it, it's, it's done well. The, uh, these are rolling forward. Um, Google and Microsoft are funding implementations, uh, some of which are uh, working in the open source community. Um, there's a PQC fork of um, OpenSSL, Open Quantum Safe, OQS. Uh, DigiCert is involved with uh, Google. Google has the boring SSL which I'm not sure if it's a fork that's been paired back to just the essentials or if it's a complete re-implementation. Uh, and uh, German feds are um, uh, funding getting the Kyber uh, signature system uh, included in a future release of Thunderbird email client. So that this is... You know, e either next year or uh, maybe late this year, um, worst early 2024, we should be seeing uh, implementations. The official fourth conference uh, is end of November. Uh, call for papers October 1st if you want to submit. Uh, and this is where they'll discuss the breaking of psych and what research is being done on the other round four candidates and what research is planned. They're targeting either 2022 late this year or next year, 2023, the feds will have draft standards. And once the draft standards are undrafted and made full standards in 2024, uh, federal information processing will allow post-quantum cryptography. So in federal systems, you won't even be allowed to use these new implementations uh, until 2024 after there are standards, which is, you know, kind of sad. Um, and sometime in 2025, 2026, the individual implementations will be certified, at which point uh, those of you doing Fed work will be able to say you're using FIPS approved algorithm implementations. Uh, the rest of us will have unapproved implementations well before that. So, you know, if, if you're willing to use a fork of OpenSSL, you're going to be able to turn this on probably next year. Now, th th this is based, aside from Mechalese, this is all new terrain. Uh, new algorithms invented for the purpose which means most of them are going to be imperfect and breakable by another smart person. So far, 62 of the 69 entrants have been broken, including two that were considered front runners uh, just before they were broken. And one of the remaining seven has what I would consider a fairly uh, strong weakness. Well, maybe I don't want to say it quite like one of the fairly significant weakness. Falcon uh, would be compromised if you uh, reuse a salt uh, or fail to salt um, as repeating the same key in hash ever gives too much information and the, the whole thing can be unwound. And you might think this is unlikely. But, you know, um, back in 2014, I think it was, Debian broke the system entropy randomness. And lots of people got identical SSH keys created or keys that were at least half identical, sharing one of the two primes. Um, all of those keys had to be canceled uh, and were being refused uh, by servers that had been updated. This is, uh, this was somewhat traumatic. Um, so lack of random, yes, 
ra random return four exactly. Um, the um, oh and. Ben Scott has a good comment in the chat. By standards of FIPS adoption, that's above average speed for adoption. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, it was 1980 that I was annoyed that FIPS was requiring me to use uh, only approved uh, compilers, and they hadn't approved a Fortran 77 yet. Uh, so I had to use a structured preprocessor for Fortran instead of being able to use Fortran 77 in 1980-81. Yeah. yeah, FIPS. So, yeah, um, not unhappy to be outside of that community. And we'll be discussing in our historical vignette the problems of reusing keys in World War II. So, yeah, um, uh, reuse of your your randomness, your keys, uh, is a recurring problem in cryptography and one that uh, designers keep thinking the users can engineer around, work around, and not mess up. And, well, users are very clever. They find new ways to mess up. And that's just, um, that's just how it is. So I'm... I'm Leary of Falcon. Uh, I don't know anything bad about any of the others. So the historical vignette. You might have wondered what that thing behind my head was uh, in the virtual background. That's the in insides of a U.S. Model 209 Hagelin cryptograph of the C38 design. Uh, recently, I guess a year ago, uh, Bletchley Park podcast uh, did an analysis more of the impact, uh, but also somewhat how they did it uh, with not Enigma, but with the Hagelin C38 and not the Germans, but the Italian Navy. And uh, from uh, ultra books, people think it was the Enigma messages that were used to interdict uh, Rommel's shipping pipeline of supply to North Africa, uh, but it was actually uh, the Hagelin machines that Bletchley Park, Britain's code breakers, uh, were reading that was letting them interdict those convoys. So this is the picture you saw over my shoulder. That's the inside of one of these machines. Boris multiple middle initials Hagelin was son of a Nobel employee uh, and was obviously a bright lad. So uh, the founder of the Nobel Prize um, put him in as uh, his personal representative in a Swiss, not Swiss, uh, at that time it was Swedish, maybe it came Swiss later, a uh, Swedish cryptography company he'd invested in that was trying to compete with Enigma. Um, and he switched their machines from being rotor-based like Enigma to using adding machine internals. Um, and let's see, can I open this? Yes. Um, and you can see my cursor. So this drum here with bars on it is like the accumulator in a 1920s, 1930s adding machine, um, except that instead of adding separate columns of numbers. It's using these little lugs that are slid along the bars to multiply a one or a zero sensed on each of these wheels um, by the number of lugs. And the sum of those multiples 
uh, gets turned into a variable gear when these bars slide three millimeters to the left, having been uh, kicked by the actuator arm, you get zero to 26 teeth around this the end of this cage, which will turn the gear here to turn the gear here to move the ciphertext alphabet that's covered with ink here forward uh, zero to uh, 27 spaces forward, or rather backwards, because forwards is backwards on a reversed alphabet, uh, under control of all six wheels, which using these, do you see the pin that's sticking out uh, from the K here? There's a little pin sticking out to the left. That's the inactive position. If it's pushed through, such that it's flush on this side, like it is at the L, it'll be sticking out on the other side where it will engage a lever we can't see here, which whacks the lug to slide this to the left as this cage rolls past these and does the addition. This is different from the way the parts are arranged in a 1920s, 1930s adding machine, but all all fairly standard individual components in terms of uh, using repeated addition to do multiplication, using a cage uh, and, and levers to communicate. Another difference here from uh, an Enigma type machine is these wheels are not geared like an odometer, all the wheels will turn simultaneously uh, one step each time the actuating lever is pushed at, at the end of the cycle uh, after one plain text letter and one cipher text letter have been printed on the slips of paper. This one appears to have only one printing head so it only, it doesn't print both at once. Some slightly larger ones print two tapes. So these will all turn one step. And what throws them out of step with each other is uh, they have uh, different numbers um, of stops on each wheel. These are slightly different diameters. Um, I think the left one here is the smallest with 17 around. So it doesn't get the Z. Uh, it, it doesn't get much um, No, no, I think it's the other way around. This, this one has more more gaps between. So I think this is the 17. So anyway, it's 17. Uh, 19, 21, 23, and 25. So there's none of these wheels have, well, the, and, and the 26 wheel as well on this one. The uh, previous model um, didn't have a 26 position wheel, but this one does. Convention here is that uh, the letter Z or Z prints as space when you're decrypting uh, making plain text, um, but you enter a space as a Z uh, when enciphering. There, there is no reserve punctuation symbol. It's just Z and whatever Z encrypts to. The um, French liked the desktop machine that was built on this principle called the B-Series and requested in 1935 that Hagelin and company uh, make a pocketable tactical device. Uh, and it was upgraded in the 1938 model to have six wheels like the one we saw there. Although the olive drab one there is the U.S. Model 209. Uh, built 
under license from Hagelin um, by the Smith Corona typewriter company, who would later buy an adding machine company, Marchand. Uh, but they they weren't an adding machine company at the, at this time. Uh, the U.S. Navy called it CSP 1500. Um, many militaries in World War II had C-38 variants. For instance, the Italian Navy uh, called it the C-38M, um, M for Marina, what, Navy. And since they use Z in Italian, but don't use the letter K, they, their model is modified so that K princes a space in clear, and so you encipher uh, spaces and punctuation as a K. So the the key space on your the the key space on your internal settings uh, is how you set the lugs on the cage and how you set the pins on the wheels. Um, there's a rather large number. Um, there's the pin settings is two raised to the 131 power because there are 131 different pins you could set on these wheels. That's the sum of the size of the wheels. Uh, so the, the internal key size is, you know, impressive. But as we've learned from looking at Enigma and other things, um, brute force isn't how you want to attack anything anyway. But using addition and multiplication, and effectively this is mechanically implemented addition, multiplication, and gates and or gates uh, in the mechanical mechanism. Um, it, it's kind of impressive when looked at as how much computation is being done in this small little box. You know, many books get it correct that it was uh, Hagelin messages that Bletchley Park was cracking uh, to block the Africa Corps supply convoys, but some books will tell you that it was Ultra and therefore Enigma. Uh, well, it wasn't even Ultra. That's the code word for Bletchley Park intelligence sent to the British or American Army, uh, which were fighting together. Um, if it was sent to the Royal Navy, it was Z teleprinted Italian, Z being the cover name for Hagelin cracks, T because we're putting it on the uh, encrypted teleprinter network, and um, I or G indicating if it's from the uh, Italian Navy or the German Navy or their air forces, which are of interest uh, to the navies. Uh, the, you may have noticed Supermarina, in the title of the podcast, uh, that's Italian for Navy headquarters, super as in supervisory or over, and marina not as in a bunch of little boats on a dock, but as in um, the Regia Marina is the Royal Navy. Yeah, I know my Italian accent's horrible. That's okay. So. Navy HQ, for some reason, chose to use a tactical cipher machine to send messages domestically on the radio to headquarters of several harbors that were making up convoys, telling them who to assign to each convoy going where. Um, well, first of all, they should have been putting this on landline teleprinters and not on uh, radio. Second, they should have been using a uh, stronger uh, cryptograph. Um, if they had the latest model uh, enigmas from Germany, that would have been a better choice. They probably thought that since the Hagelin was a newer design, it was stronger. Um, 
Well, it wasn't. Um, the Italians did understand that sending even one very long message, there was a, you know, stop that. Um, one very long message allows a purely statistical attack. Um, they might not have understood that several medium long messages might allow the same thing. They did understand that sending two messages that used overlapping key sequences um, could cause a problem. So they forbid overlapping at all by mandating um, starting at offsets of the mandated maximum message length. Um, this wasn't perhaps ideal. It was an idea. Bletchley Park had several ways of breaking this. They weren't the only ones to break it, by the way. Um, if there were errors um, causing retransmission of, of messages with the, the same key, um, that was a quick entry. Uh, two messages accidentally sent with the came, same key with different contents uh, could also be solved as a depth. Um, breaking the depths was frequently done using a crib. Um, they had a tendency to start their messages with the equivalent of two colon, just like our emails. Well, in Italian, two is per, P-E-R, uh, with a K for space. That gets you a four-letter crib of perk. If it's a reply from harbor to headquarters, it's going to be perk supermarine perk or supermarine up perk. Um, that gets you a, a, real, a really nice, let's see if this works. Um, and we use the bridge term cross riff. Live streaming is on. Now, when, the way you tell if uh, you found the crib in a depth is since the two messages were enciphered by the same key, if you add them to each other or subtract them, as the case may be, uh, you cancel the key and you have one message enciphered with the other message as key. So if you try... Uh, your crib, you should get clear text uh, coming out uh, as the uh, out the other side, and that tells you you found it. And then you look to complete the partial word at the end of that text, and that goes back through the encryption and tells you what the beginning of the next word on the first message is, and you just zigzag between the two like you're growing a crossword puzzle or working between hand and dummy uh, playing playing out a bridge hand. Um, this gives you fragments of both messages um, and their shared key. From a long enough fragment of the key, you can work out the internal pin positions and lug multipliers uh, and the start position for the message, at which point you can read the whole message, um, and you now know the internal settings of the day or month, depending how often they're updating them. And with 131 pins to set, you're not doing it every four hours like maybe you should. They were doing it monthly. Uh, once you find that, it's going to be easy to um, break messages the rest of the month. Uh, cribs were not quite as easy as on Enigma. Enigma had the flaw that a letter could never represent itself in the Enigma cipher. So you could drag a crib along and see if any letters matched between the crib and the guest plain text. And a long enough crib would only have a couple of false matches uh, along with the one good match.
uh, that that trick isn't workable on the Hagelin because an E can encrypt to an E on a Hagelin. So it avoided that problem. So the the Italian system of key, um, picking starting positions and the indicators to use with them should have been secure if it had been used correctly, but see the previous discussion about users using things correctly. The uh, So who broke it? This is the same Bill Tut, Tommy Flowers, and the Dulles Hill Post Office research gang that uh, did the uh, a number of the special crazy machines like Colossus and Heath Robinson at Bletchley Park and even added some features uh, to the uh, Polish Turing Bombas. Bill Tut was the research section Bletchley Park person that figured out the manual depth breaking technique uh, and advised on the uh, deeper breaking hardware problem. Tommy Flowers was lead designer. Sidney Broadhurst, uh, there's a third name listed on Wikipedia whose name I forget. Of course, this work was highly classified until quite recently. So uh, Bill Tut was basically known for his teaching in Canada after the war and only that. Tommy Flowers and Sidney Broadhurst are remembered uh, by the public for building the electronic randomizer for the first post office premium bond lottery, uh, where in addition to your uh, paltry savings bond uh, interest income during the depression after the war that they had in England, they, they had depressions before and after the war. They didn't have the boom we had in the uh, late 40s, early 50s. Um, that they would have a lottery prize for one, one of the bondholders every three months would get a nice big bonus payment, which was an incentive to invest in the bonds. And they built this big electronic randomizer um, basically a special purpose digital computer using valves and relays and noise diode tubes uh, to make guaranteed random numbers to pick numbers of bonds that had actually been sold to be the winners. And the post office, post office is responsible for a lot of things in England that it isn't here. The post office uh, ran the telephone system, ran the telegraph system, in much of the world, um, telegraphy um, and telegrams were part of the post office. And the, um, so that, that's how this technology was built in the post office for their, their savings bonds. And that's what the public knew um, uh, Tommy and Sydney for. Engineers knew the two of them uh, for building an all electronic telephone exchange, uh, which was put into service three years before AT&T did the equivalent, um, which of course was a prerequisite to go to Touchtone. Um, but this was initially doing electronic switching of pulse dialed connections, but extendable uh, to Touchtone. And a portrait of Bill Tut. So the machine that Flowers and Broadhurst designed to solve this problem was codenamed Nightingale. Not a lot is known because it's still mostly classified. The um, It at least was an emulator that would run much faster than a uh, mechanical 
machine like the uh, adding machine I showed you the guts of uh, to test uh, and do production uh, decryption uh, of intercepted messages. Uh, so I'm guessing it probably had punched paper tape uh, inputs and outputs. Uh, the uh, but it may very well have had a keyboard as well because uh, Bletchley Park Trust comments that one of the wartime operator gals uh, remembered that operating it was like playing a church organ, which sounds to me like it had both a keyboard and a whole bunch of uh, mode switches, function switches. Um, it is variously stated that it had functions in addition to just simple encryption, decryption faster than uh, a mechanical duplicate. There is, there are no known photographs. There is one suspected photograph. The archives have a photo of a unit that may appears to be 10 foot high, multiple telephone company rack units that has a repetition of six clusters of mechanism on it that 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 would that would be what I would expect it to look like, but we don't know if that's what it is. Um, so it likely had, you know, it it's known it had some additional crypt analytic support functions. That much has been stated. Um, it does, but we don't know if it was statistical analysis or crib dragging or um, in insertion aut automatically checking uh, a crib uh, and the month's internal settings against uh, possible start positions uh, once you'd set the monthly internal settings. Um, something like that would be its additional functions. Uh, but uh, beyond that would be speculative. We can hope that more things will be uh, unclassified over time. So how was it built? The Before the all-electronic exchange and after uh, they stopped using uh, Mabel plugging uh, plug cables to put through phone calls, the exchanges in the phone system we're using things called uniselectors or stepper switches, also known as stepper relays. These are relays that have more than an off and an on position. Uh, they cycle through a cycle of positions every time they're actuated uh, by the electromagnetic coil. Uh, they can have um, one to 10 uh, pole uh, commutators that rotate and from uh, 8 to 26 uh, positions. So they're, like all relays, they're described as number of poles, number of throws. Uh, and so um, the first picture here is a um, one pole uh, 26 throw and uh, down below is a six pole 25 throw uh, uni selector. And the Dallas Hill gang had already been using these sorts of devices in making the telephone exchanges. Uh, there were automated exchanges as early as the 1920s. The, so this was very well understood technology. So well understood that um, the nation of Japan um, used these stepper switches instead of Enigma type rotors or Hegelin style pinwheels uh, to implement the moving portion 
of one of their code machines. Uh, they used a uh, 8 by 25 stepper relays, um, not as rotors. The commutator going around was not emulating rotation of a rotor, um, but it was uh, selecting a position of the ROM wired on the outside of the connections. While a rotor has its uh, ROM wiring tucked inside. Uh, a U.S. Army uh, signal security or uh, special intelligence service officer mathematician recognized the purple ciphers regularity um, implied stepper switches. Um, he couldn't get official permission to buy stepper switches from the phone company supply office. So he used his own cash um, to buy uh, a half dozen uh, six wide steppers to recreate the Japanese machine. Um, he didn't guess what the width was, but it didn't matter since um, running three or four of them in parallel um, cre creates um, the, the same virtual width. Neither uh, Japan nor America in the purple machine used a stepper that was as wide as the ROM was. It was built up out of either three or four uh, in parallel. Uh, so it's not in any way unique for Dallas Hill uh, to have used telephone company relay parts uh, in building this machine. They'd previously used them in making a fast emulator, not the breaker for Enigma, but the machine that use, uh, they could use a Type X um, British enciphering machine that had been uh, lobotomized uh, to think it was an Enigma to uh, decrypt a message once they had the key, um, just typing on it and writing down the answer. Um, but if they had um, the message uh, on tape, they could uh, feed the punch tape into an emulator that used steppers uh, and get printed output on a uh, teletype connected to the machine uh, and maybe even get it on uh, a tape out. And this was much more efficient. The fact that they'd done this wasn't in the early histories. This was covered up. And they also had an emulator for Sturgeon uh, in addition to um, the breaker for Tunney. And we have to assume that these were used in the Hagel and Nightingale emulator. Um, and quite, I'm guessing, uh, would, would have used the 26 position uh, stepper um, to emulate the rotors um, and use a, uh, a fast reset the home function uh, to do the wraparound. Uh, so using it in the opposite configuration from the purple machine. But that is strictly speculative. Um, the only evidence we have is that uh, Dallas Hill used steppers in some systems and was using some form of relay logic in this system. Uh, the uniselectors were, of course, also used in slower parts of um, Colossus Tunney. And there was even a strap-on accessory using GPO selectors, general post office selectors, um, to the Bomba um, that checked a solution, a uh, potential solution called a stop, uh, by running through a bunch of combinations on the selectors and it ran through the selector position so fast it was nicknamed the machine gun circuit because it sounded rat-a-tat-tat. Now from 
intelligence collected after the war from German prisoners of war and from uh, raiding German intelligence sites, which is the intelligence equivalent of the paperclip project, which collected up uh, Werner von Braun and the other rocket scientists. Um, TICOM uh, collected up what we could of uh, radio intelligence, signals intelligence, uh, decryption um, uh, from the Germans. And from that we know they were capable of breaking U.S. traffic using the M209 or CSP 1500 as well. Uh, they did not, they rarely achieved the four hours to break that the U.S. expected and used in its assignment of this to only tactical uses, um, <clears throat> only use it in things where the message won't be useful to the enemy in four hours, which is the correct way to assign it, unlike the Italian Navy. Um, they reportedly had some custom braking machinery on use for this. Um, so there wasn't just the accounting machine, tabulating machines that they were known to use. But we, um, and there is, uh, a, there are sketches and design discussions of that machine in the TICOM archive that don't make a lot of sense. Um, because they were, um, I think, provided by a guy who maintained them as opposed to the guy who designed them. So it, it, it's not clear exactly what he's talking about. Um, and then it was translated from the German. So, you know, if you've ever looked at a 1930s patent, it's like that except passed through Google Translate. <laughs> but the um, it does say that the Germans used their machine for detecting uh, when two messages were in depth because somebody like reused or overlapped keys, which is interesting because uh, the US and I believe also the UK had separate machines for detecting coincidences uh, as opposed to using a special purpose machine having a separate setting. And uh, for your further perusal, uh, when I share these documents with Jabber to put on the website, there'll be a, um, a bibliography of uh, where I found this, including uh, the uh, TICOM reports. And there's also some footnotes, which nobody really needs to see now. Let's see. Okay. There are no questions, no raised hands. Floor is open. Unmute yourself if you have questions. Good presentation. Yeah, very good. Thank you. I have I have fun digging into the history. Out of curiosity, uh, is there is there any uh, easy way to take the slideshow and then turn it into PDF? Um, the PD it can't. I don't think I can turn the slideshow into a PDF, but I can turn my speaker's notes into a PDF and you can have uh, both of them as HTML with supporting side files. The, the well. slideshow libraries usually have uh, a PDF uh, I mean, uh, you know, printable view built in. If you go to print preview right now, it might be something you can save to PDF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe. Maybe. So whoever wants to do it, um, you can just uh, save the yep. PDF and send that to Jabber. 
Oh, no, just send me the original HTML and that stuff. I'll, I'll figure out the PDF stuff myself. Yeah, you probably want to shift it to landscape. But I'm... I, I don't vouch for that. I'll, I'll worry about it after the fact. The, the yeah. HTML, fine. Yeah, I'll have to send you the... You know, the, the full directory with the, the CSS and the uh, images. But yeah. And put it in a zip file. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But so, uh, anyway, what, I, what I've been, if you haven't looked at it, Pandoc uh, is a um, neat thing. Oh, is that what you use for this? I thought you used something called uh, Slidey. Slidey is the JavaScript library. Oh. Uh, Pan Pandoc is a universal document converter. Oh. Pan meaning all. Um, and it's um, sort of markdown centric. Um, many of its conversions are bilateral so that it can try to convert a Microsoft Word docx into Markdown. Uh, you may lose something. Um, but if you want to achieve the, what we originally intended with Roth and Tech and SGML, the ancestor of HTML and XML, was separating uh, content from formatting so that authors could just write their content and then decide later um, how to format it so you don't get bogged down in formatting while you're authoring. And so you can retarget the same content uh, to other targets. Uh, this is the best I've run across. Um, I'm using um and there are theoretically um ability to go direct to pdf um but the adjusting the style adjusting the css that's used for creating the presentation into something usable for PDF uh, may, be, may be a heck of a lot of work. So I don't recommend it. Recommend you try it, Jobber. If I was doing this more often than once a year, um, I'd want to figure out a workflow to do this. And you know, there are multiple slideshow formats. Uh, Reveal is actually fairly well known for this sort of uh, JavaScript full presentation in one HTML file. Um, I, I tried S5 and Slidey because they seem to be uh, best fit for my use. Uh, what the uh, Slidey doesn't directly support a speaker's note output the way S5 does. Um, S5 would have put my speaker notes in a synchronized second window. So I wouldn't have had to have kept uh, scrolling my other window myself. Um, but uh, Slidey, uh, Pandoc observes a colon, colon, colon notes section in the markdown uh, and suppresses it. Um, when creating Slidey. Um, so I just made myself a little file that would make a second version of the document that didn't use Slidey and um, displayed the notes section uh, in line uh, to make a scrolling HTML that's the whole thing just scrollable that would uh, perhaps be better for somebody with a screen reader uh, and would also uh, serve as my speaker notes. 
good. And this is also what I'm using uh, for, let's see. Um, the Reborn Boston Promongers webpage is HTML generated uh, from Markdown. So this is uh, serving static HTML, no dynamic elements. Um, which sort of means there's nothing to hack. Um, and since the markdown to HTML translation is being done on my machine, before I check it in to Git uh, and upload it to GitHub, uh, I will never lose historical content when the service provider cuts me off from free ever again. The, the markdown lives on my machine uh, and on GitHub and anywhere else we fork and synchronize and it, it, it's lost proof. And I'd like to actually check out some uh, stuff in Pandoc. Do you think in addition to the HTML, you could also include all the sources, like the markdown stuff? I can play around with it and see uh, what, what the different options do. Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, right, I don't have a top level. Um, I experimented with the, the markdown um, uh, and GitHub uh, I.O. Uh, serving uh, with my um, uh, personal web articles being served out of GitHub. And it gives me enough, uh, gives me just enough control. Uh, let's see. There, there's the markdown that creates this page, which is the preview um, that, that we saw over on the other site. Uh, it's uh, the whole thing's pretty slick. Somebody's got background conversation. I, I had some. I don't know why I did that on the other one. The. Um, Oh, that's because I didn't use Slidey on that one. Yeah, all right, you, you'll, you'll get the uh, supporting shell commands and markdown uh, in, in the zip. Be harder to not give them to you, Jabber. Okay, sounds good. Um, you know, given that you're going to publish the resulting documents, I don't feel the need to put them up on my own. Uh, article tree, um, but you know my uh, my presentation for Natick went up there, uh, and I put it there. If you weren't putting it up, but makes sense to keep everything uh, together. Having Blue serve the uh, attachments to the meeting logs makes it survivable. 
And one, one of the issues in the past that I had a lot of problems with was uh, when I'd go back like uh, five or ten years for some old uh, meeting, and then the, all, all the links were uh, dead. Yep. I really wanted yep. to always preserve it. Yeah. I mean, even if the original presenter <clears throat> um, re reposts it at their new website, the the URL is moved, but you know, frequently old content isn't uh, maintained when uh, websites are refurbed, and, and it's really frustrating. If you're lucky, you can replace the 404 archival link with an archive.org historical link, but some things never get scraped. Hmm. Actually, maybe I could specifically add them to the, uh, the Internet Archive. Uh, but, uh, what does that mean? Oh, yes. I mean, you, you can specifically request Internet Archive to scrape us. Um, that's, uh, that's a good thing. They're, uh, you can ask the Wayback Machine to save specific pages. Just have to make sure that the robots.txt file doesn't block them. Submit it, uh, check it a couple days later, see if it's okay. And uh, oh, I still want a local copy in case the internet archive someday goes down. Yeah. Well, I'm they, 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 trying to sue them for uh, all sorts of nonsensical reasons. Yeah. I, you know, the, the, the best. The best insurance there is to donate and uh, make sure your Congress critters know that uh, they should be supporting Internet Archive, but uh, not relying on them entirely and keeping copies of things we care about elsewhere is also good. Absolutely. The past few years, I've been throwing them 100 bucks every December. Yep. They do their uh, their guys. Yep, they're good people. Questions? Thank you, Bill. I thought it was a good presentation. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Entirely welcome. Brian, go ahead and unmute yourself. Maybe Brian was trying to clap and hit the raise hand button instead. Um, we have the meeting booked for October, but we could use, we could use ideas for what to do for November or December. Now, Richard Prairie mentioned that he uh, he had a he got a Steam Deck. He already said no. Well, that doesn't mean we can't do a Steam Deck pocket copy. We can find one of the developers. Yeah. That, 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 looks, like, that looks like a neat keep neat piece of kit. Uh, definitely, I could talk on that. Does anyone uh, does anyone know how to track down the developers for it? Any ideas who we might invite to talk about it? I'll take the silence as a no. Any other thoughts about uh, topics we could uh, do for November and December? Uh, 
I'd love to see a Steam Deck presentation. I don't know anybody who has them other than Richard. I'm trying to avoid the temptation. <coughs> I took a look at it. I could never afford it anyway. So it's not really. If nobody has anything else to say, I guess we may as well shut down the meeting, huh? Good night, everyone.